all know better, right? We've all read the articles, seen those documentaries. It's the same message. Look, McDonald's is really bad for you. It's very high in fat and calories, and we don't even know where the meat comes from. And we're all like, that's disgusting. I'll have a Big Mac, a large fry, and a two-gallon drum of Diet Coke. Because there's a McDonald's denial. And we all embrace it. No one's going in there innocent. We're walking into a red and yellow building with a giant M over it. Was this a library? Well, I'll get some fries while I'm here. Because those McDonald's fries are truly amazing, right? Has your mother ever made anything as good as a McDonald's fry? Not even close. We lie to ourselves when we eat McDonald's fries. We're like, oh, they're so thin, they couldn't be fattening. <laughs> you ever eat too many McDonald's fries? Of course not! <laughs> There's never enough of them! There's always that moment when you're eating McDonald's fries where you're like, what happened? <laughs> Where'd they go? Oh, that is just way too true, isn't it? Well, we're in our second week of our series, Takeout, and we're talking about what it looks like to develop a healthy spiritual appetite. We're diving into what it means to hunger and thirst after God and to crave the things in this life that will cause spiritual health and spiritual growth. First thing I want to do is give a shout out to our Harrisburg campus. Listen, today, uh, Wandy mentioned this their soft launch, which means it's their practice service. Before next week, they got to actually invite the community. And so they set up everything, they did everything, and they had service over there. Uh, next week is that first preview service for the community. So downtown campus, I need you to cheer for them. Give them a congratulations, right? Okay, now confession. They're not going to hear that because they already had service. We record our first service and they watch it. I just wanted to see if you would still cheer. Uh, so you did, and awesome. I wanted you to be part of it. But Last week, we talked about spiritual fast food and how often we shortchange ourselves. We settle for less than what God has for us, for what our itching ears want to hear. The rest of this series, we're going to talk about what does it look like to develop the right habits, the right hungers, to start to crave the right things. Today, I want to talk to you about an appetite for righteousness. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, if you're using one of the Bibles here in the warehouse, it'll be on page 579. Uh, if you didn't bring your Bible, you can raise your hand. The ushers will bring you one. If you don't own a Bible, please raise your hand and then just keep this Bible. Don't turn it back in. We want to make sure you've got God's word in your life. But Matthew chapter five, uh, page, get your hand. And if you need one, get your hands high and see some of you up front here. You can just, uh, Matthew chapter five, page 579. Matthew five uh, is a section of the Bible called the Beatitudes, which is part of Jesus' most famous sermon. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, now, uh, we're going to do a whole series on the Beatitudes later in this year, but today I just want to give you a little background here. Uh, this is happening shortly after Jesus has begun his public ministry. And, and as he's out there beginning this ministry, the word Beatitudes is often translated blessed or blessings, which is true, but it's, it's a little misleading because it's only part of the story. Uh, really, this is, a better translation of this is someone to be congratulated, someone to be jealous of, uh, someone uh, whose place in life is enviable. It, it's not just happy, it's joy and contentment. It, it, Jesus is saying, if these things are true in your life, then your life is to be enviable. If these things are true, then you should be congratulated. Man, people should be jealous of you because your life is awesome. And then he goes on and he describes a bunch of things that don't seem so enviable. Like he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who mourn. <laughs> Your life is enviable if you're, if you're mourning. And, and so obviously they need a little explanation. And this, uh, the part we're going to look at, Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, is no exception. He says this, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now we've got to unpack that. We've got to talk about what that means. We've all experienced hunger. Uh, we know what it is to eat and then be hungry again. And I don't know about you, I like to eat, okay? Uh, I think eating is fantastic. And uh, so we know what it's like, and, and the words used here for hunger and thirst are what are called present active participles, which basically means they describe something that's happening over and over and over again. 
And so it's saying, blessed are those who over and over and over again, hunger and thirst, okay? And, and so we know that part. We, we know that you don't eat once and then you're good to go. You, you eat a little bit and then you got to eat again, you got to eat again, you got to eat again. And like I said, some of us really enjoy that. I really enjoy, I like eating. Eating is my friend. Um, so we know what it is to be hungry and then be hungry again. From that standpoint, we get this. What we don't understand is that this goes much deeper. This is not just talking about daily hunger. This is talking about desperate hunger, to be desperately hungry. And this is a picture as Americans, by and large, we don't get. Like we know what it is kind of be hungry, but we say things to ourselves like, you know, we haven't eaten in a little while and our tummy gurgles, you know, a bit. And we're like, ooh, I'm really hungry. No, no, I think I might be starving. Like we have the audacity to use that word, right? But we don't know what it is to go days and days without food to go days without water, and to literally be longing for the tiniest bit of nourishment. We don't know what it is to truly be starving for something. And that's what Christ is referring to. A great illustration of this is found in the Bible, uh, the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. Uh, Many of you have heard this story. Maybe you haven't, so let me just give you a snapshot. Uh, It starts with two sons, one of whom is completely selfish. And that son says, you know, Dad, I don't really care that much about you, but I do want my share of your money. And the dad is really gracious, so he gives him his share of the inheritance. The son runs off to a foreign land, spends all of it on partying and living it up. Eventually, he ran out of money. Now, interestingly enough, when he had a lot of money, he had a lot of friends. When the money ran out, guess what else ran out? Yeah, the friends. And so things start going downhill fast. He has no money. He has no one to turn to. Now, this is a young Jewish kid. And so he gets a job feeding pigs which for a Jewish kid is unheard of because they see pigs as unclean animals. So now he's feeding these animals he's normally not allowed to touch. Not only is he he feeding them this slop, he's looking at the slop and he's going, oh man, that looks good. And craving the husks that the pigs are eating. You might say, well, that's obviously the picture of being hungry. No, not yet. It gets worse. You need to see this. John Nelson Darby of the Plymouth Brethren says this, To be hungry is not enough. I must be really starving to know what is in God's heart towards me. When the prodigal son was hungry, he went to feed upon husks. Listen, but when he was starving, he turned to his father. And that's the difference. And that's what we're talking about in Matthew 5, verse 6. Jesus is not saying, blessed are those who are hungry for a little bit of me. He's saying, blessed are those who are starving for more righteousness, who are desperate for more. Because that's what brings about the blessing. Now, have you ever desired God like that? I have in glimpses, but I can be honest, I don't desire him as much as I probably should. I, we all have this hunger. I think that many of us just look to fill that hunger with the wrong things. See, hunger is all about filling an emptiness, about filling a void in our lives. And, and we're all looking to fill that hole in our lives. The problem is too often we fill it with things that leave us empty. We fill it with things that satisfy for a moment but we don't fill it with righteousness. But if we fill our lives with things, anything other than God's righteousness, it will never be full. Here's why. Blaise Pascal describes what we have inside us as a God-shaped void. So imagine with me, if you will, and maybe, maybe this really, you can relate to this. You have a hole in your life, a God-shaped hole. And so is it any wonder the only thing that can fill the God-shaped hole is God? And yet we try to fill it with all these things of the world that for a moment last and then still leave us feeling empty. You ever felt that way? Now, this is not new. This happens all through the scriptures. In Jeremiah chapter 2, starting with verse 11, a great picture. It says, has any nation ever traded its gods for new ones? Even though they're not gods at all, yet my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. The heavens are shocked at such a thing and shrink back in horror and dismay, says the Lord, for my people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. This is where we are. I want you to see this picture. We have exchanged the things of God for worthless idols. Does that sound like our culture at all? And not only that, he says we've dug for ourselves cracked cisterns. A cistern was a big vat that they would bury under the water to keep, they put water or bury under the ground and they put water in it to keep the water, you know, cold and fresh and this and that for a while. The problem is he says, our lives are like cracked cisterns. We pour our lives full of things that just seep out through the holes. 
We, we try to fill our lives with, with more and more of this world, more money, more power, more sex, more education, more stuff, more relationships, and they will quench our appetite for, for a moment, for a season. And then it leaks out, it leaves us feeling emptier than before. We misplace our desires in life. We're hungry and thirsty for the wrong thing. So what I want to ask you, and I want, to, what I want you to ask yourself today is, what are you hungry for? Like, where is your heart? Because the call is, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. He says they will be filled because he knows when you get a taste of God, you'll want more. And it will satisfy you in a way that nothing else can. Now, the problem is, if you're like me, there are moments, there are seasons where I desperately hunger for God. Other times, not so much. And so what I want to look at today is, how do you nurture a hunger for righteousness? How do you get to yourself where you're craving more and more of God's righteousness? So number one, you have to taste it first. In order to hunger for it, you got to taste it. Psalm 34, 8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Now this would seem like a no brainer, you would think. Uh, unfortunately not. My, as my kids would prove, it's not. We like to try new foods at our house. And my son, Truett, does not like to try new foods at our house. And, and so we'll put stuff in front of him. He'll be, I don't like that. Well, you've never had it before. Oh, no, I know I, know I don't like it. Well, you've got, you've got to taste it. You don't even know what it tastes like. It doesn't matter. I don't like it. Well, what don't you like about it? I don't like the shape or the smell or the color or the consistency. Yeah, no, I just, I, I just know I'm not going to like that. And nothing you can do will change his mind. You got kids like that in your life, right? Now, is it, I think that many find ourselves here spiritually. Do you know people who are not even willing to taste and see? You know those people in your life, they've already said, oh, I don't like that. Maybe they had a bad experience when they were growing up with church. Maybe they met a Christian they don't like, but for whatever reason, they assume they know what church is about. And I don't want to have anything to do with that. Now, they don't want to read the Bible, can't do that. And, and they don't ever want to walk in a church. They don't, want to, they don't ever want to do that. I already know I, I know I won't like that. So nothing you can do will convince them. They won't even, they're not even willing to try. The problem is everything in their head is a result of a picture they have in their head that might not even be accurate. It's the result of what other people have said about God that might not even be accurate, but they won't taste for themselves and see. They've already made up their minds. We know people like that, right? But I think a bigger problem in the church is, I think the church is full of people, and not this church, I'm just saying the church. I think the church is full of people who, who really want to taste more of God. They want to taste and see that God is good. There's only one problem. They're full. I think the biggest problem in the church is that we don't have an appetite for God. We have so filled ourselves with other things that we've got no room left for God. Like a kid eating a candy bar before supper we're not going to eat the good supper mom puts in front of us. Let, let me give you some examples. If I, like I love my weekends, I love watching movies, entertaining myself. If I entertain myself to death Saturday night, if I'm out with friends, I'm up late till you know, 12, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, and then come to church, am I going to be ready to eat? Am I going to have an appetite for God? Absolutely not. Does that make sense? Or, or how about this? We're doing life group signups right now, and a lot of people say, I, I don't have time for a life group. Oh, okay, well, why not? Well, I got a ton of stuff going on. Oh, okay, good. What? Well, I got this activity and this thing and these. Okay, those are all good things, right? They could all be good things, but if you've got so much going on, you can't make time to dive into God's word. Do you see the problem? There's never a lack of things to do in this world, is there? Hobbies and entertainment and things. That we, if we so fill ourselves with things, they could be good things. They just don't leave room for God. Proverbs 27, 7 describes it this way. He who is full loathes honey, but to the hungry, even what is bitter tastes sweet. So the question really becomes, are you hungry? Because you cannot hunger for righteousness if your life is so full of the things of this world. The greatest steak dinner in the world is going to, taste, going to look terrible to you if you just got done stuff in your face, right? If you come in here and you're so full of... The, the stresses and the cares and the activities and the entertainments and all these things in this world, and you're just so full of it, there's simply not going to be room for God. The richest sermon in the world won't have any appeal. Because it's not that you don't want God, you just don't have room to fill yourself with the world and with Him. 
John Piper sums it up well. He says, uh, the weakness of our hunger for God is not because he is unsavory, but because we keep ourselves stuffed with other things. So question number one is, am I hungry? Am I even hungry for God? Because he wants you to taste and see that he is good, but in order to taste, you've got to be hungry. Number two, you got to admit, you must admit you're malnourished. Okay, malnourishment, believe it or not, is not about how much food you eat. It's not about uh, not having enough to eat. It's about not eating what your body needs. Uh, I go to the gym and work out and, and some different things like that, and I try to stay in shape and eat right. And, and Matt, who's, who's a trainer that works at the gym I go to and, and attends here, he says, you know, there's two factors at play, right? There's what you eat at home, there's your diet, and then there's your exercise. And he says, a lot of people, you know, New Year's resolution, like right now, my gym is packed. It wasn't on December 15th. But January 15th, for some reason, it is. Hmm, you know? Uh, but people, they jump in. I'm, this is the year, you know? I'm going to get in. And they get in the gym, and they start killing it in the gym, and they're coming four times a week, and they're doing all that. The problem is they're not adjusting their eating habits at home. And Matt would say 60% or more is your eating habits at home. Like, for instance, um, I've literally seen people at my gym on the elliptical burning the calories, Right? while drinking a frappuccino. Like if you're doing that on the elliptical, what are you eating and drinking when you're not on the elliptical, right? Here, here's my point. Uh, no amount of going through the motions makes up for unhealthy habits. Listen, that's true physically. It's also true spiritually. When you're talking about taking care of your spiritual well-being, there is no amount of church on Sunday that's going to make, make up for poor spiritual habits the rest of the week. Uh, 1 Timothy 4.8 says this, physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. Jesus makes a similar statement as he's preaching or as he's uh, talking to Satan when he's being tempted in Matthew chapter 4 verse 4. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, listen, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You cannot ignore your spiritual needs. You need to hear this. If you want righteousness, you can have it. I don't think we understand this. Where you are right now in your spiritual walk, you're there because you chose it. See, listen, if we want more of God, it's available. If you wanted, you could have that deeper walk with God, that more personal prayer life. You could dive in deeper. You could have, if you wanted, you could have a better marriage. You could be living out his will for your life. You could begin to grow spiritually. If you wanted, you could find time to serve or time for a life group or time to do whatever it is that God's calling you to do. If you want, you could be the man or woman of God. If you want, you could be the one to break the cycle in your family, to, to break that destructive habit or pattern or that you, you can have the spiritual life you want, but it starts by admitting that you don't already have it. It starts by being willing to go, okay, honesty time. I eat a bunch of junk. I fill my life with things that aren't necessarily bad. They're just not God. What would it look like to begin to eat healthy spiritual food, to get into God's word, to start a prayer life? What would it look like to begin to do those things? Because I don't. And because of it, I'm spiritually malnourished. You got to own that. And then once you own it, number three, you must intentionally eat healthy. Keyword intentionally, right? Uh, did you know that chocolate is a vegetable? <laughs> now, hear me out, hear me out. It's derived from cocoa or also known as cacao beans. A bean is a vegetable. Now, technically it's a legume, but they're in the same family. And you might say, well, but Pastor Phil, yeah, that might be true, but it's full of sugar. Aha! Sugar comes from sugar cane or sugar beets, which are both plants, therefore proving that chocolate is a vegetable. Not only that, chocolate is full of milk. Milk is part of what? The dairy group. So this is a veritable health food. Can I get an amen in here? Amen. Here's my point. You can justify an appetite for anything. <laughs> but here's the problem. You are what you eat. You can justify an appetite for anything, but you are what you eat. I wish it weren't so. It is. Nutritionists will tell you, appetite determines diet. Diet determines intake. Your intake determines your health. Let me give you an example. Caffeine. 
We all know that too much caffeine harms your body. I'm not going to lie. I've had a few cups of joe this morning. You might be able to tell. Actually, I'm normally like this. Uh, Pray for my wife. We know that there are certain foods that raise our cholesterol. They're bad for our heart. But listen, fast food restaurants are not going out of business, are they? We know there are certain foods we need to eat. They're healthy. They're good for our bodies. But there's not like a run on broccoli, right? Stores are not running out of broccoli everywhere. We know this stuff. We know it in our heads. But knowing it isn't enough, is it? We have to intentionally shift our eating. We have to begin to create new habits right Habits where we choose to do the right thing until we literally, our body begins to crave the right things until our body actually goes, I want more of that. And we have to change what we hunger for. That, that is Jesus' message to us. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who literally go through the work of shifting everything that they used to hunger for and beginning to develop the right habits and the right hungers and choosing to make choices until it so affects them that they begin to actually crave more of God. And when they do, they'll be filled because God is the only thing that can fill you up. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they will be filled. Jesus says, hunger determines health. Whatever we hunger for will determine how healthy we actually are. In the Old Testament, there is a terrible judgment. And Israel was judged multiple times by God for different things. I think this is the worst judgment on Israel. People had turned their backs on God again. They weren't hungering for more of him. And so God sent a famine. But it wasn't a famine of food. It was a famine of his word. You can read about it near the end of the Old Testament in the, in the minor prophet Amos, chapter 8. And starting with the verse 11, this is what is written. The time is surely coming, says the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea and wander from border to border, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Beautiful girls and strong young men will grow faint in that day, thirsting for the Lord's word. Listen, here's what I think about this book. I think a couple things. First of all, I think it's God's sovereign word, but I also think that we take it for granted. See, I have multiple Bibles in my office right now laying around my house. On my, on my smartphone, I downloaded an app for free. I have, the, I have the Bible at my fingertips all of the time. There's no time I can't access the, God, the word of God. And because that's true, listen, because that's true, I think we take God's word for granted. We assume we're just always, it's just always gonna be there. But listen, a famine of God's word would be an absolute crisis. If man cannot live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, then a famine of his word is a serious, serious problem. And that's what happened. After Amos spoke these words, there are 400 years of silence where God did not speak to his people. From the end of the Old Testament to the beginning of the New Testament, nearly twice as long as this country has existed. God did not speak to his people. Sin caused a famine of his word. Because listen, listen, when we quit hungering for God's word, he simply stops talking. You might say in your life, man, I don't, I don't hear God's voice at all. Are you hungry to? When was the last time you listened? When did you stop opening up his word, praying, seeking after him? Because when we quit hungering for God's word, he simply stops talking. Do you hunger for God's voice, because hunger determines health. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Christ said this. He said, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And here's the result. And he will give you everything you need. So here's my question for you this morning. What are you seeking? What are you hungering for? What do you crave? What do you have an appetite for? Is it fame? Reputation? You know? Is it fortune, money, security? Is it career advancement? Are you hungry for a secure future? 
Are you hungering after that marriage? I got just to meet that right person and get married. Are you hungering? I'm just hungry for retirement. I just want to buy this. I just want to do that. I just want to go there. Will you continue to chase this world, chasing after everything you've ever wanted? Or will you seek him first, knowing full well, listen, that you will not get everything you want, but that if you trust him and, tr- and seek him and his righteousness, he will give you everything that you need. And that's far more valuable than all you could want. The choice is is yours. It's ultimately up to us. We have a choice to pursue that. There is a way to live. That's what this beatitude is talking about. There is a way to live. The result of living that way is you will be full. And you can have that. But it all depends on what you're hungry for. If you will hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be filled. My question to you this morning is, are you hungry enough? So here's a challenge we're issuing to both of our campuses. Change your eating habits. We want to give you an opportunity. In fact, we want to help you along. We're offering what we're calling a 30-day reading challenge. It will start tomorrow. If you would like to get into God's Word, whether you're reading His Word or not, I want you to take your hub connection right now, your your little brochure thing. I want you to open it up, and where where it says, ask for prayer requests, I want you to write 30-day challenge. If you write those words, we're going to send you a link. It's on the Uversion app if you have a smartphone. If you don't, it, you'll still be able to access it on the internet. That link is a link to 30 days of reading through the book of Proverbs. You'll read one chapter a day through the book of Proverbs. And we want to challenge you. If you're in God's Word already, you can maybe add this to what you're doing. If not, if you're like, man, I haven't been in God's Word forever, this is our challenge. Why don't you create a habit? Why don't you start, take five minutes a day, eat something healthy to begin your day. One chapter a day, 30 days through Proverbs. If you're willing to take on that challenge, just write on that prayer line, 30 day challenge. Sign up. Tomorrow we will send you the link and you you can begin just the beginning pieces of the journey to hunger and thirst for more of God. Let's pray. Father God, I think this room is full of people who want more of you. That's why they're here. I I think they really do desperately want more of you. And and yet, so many of us, our lives are so full. And God, not not with evil things or, or horrible things, but not with you. We just so filled our lives with money and entertainment and stress and all these different things that we have not got any time into our schedules built for you. God, I pray that you would challenge the people in this room to take time over the next 30 days to get into your word, to begin to develop a right habit so that by the end of it, they might hunger and thirst for righteousness. And and if they do this, I guarantee, I know, God, that they will be filled in a way that they've not felt before. God, there's so many things to distract our appetites, so much entertainment, so many things out there so many worries and cares of this world, but we surrender them all to you right now. And I pray that you would give us the courage to to open up your word, to take these challenges, maybe to start a prayer life, maybe to start doing something that starts feeding that. And God, would you give us an appetite where we hunger and thirst, not for more of this world, but for more of your righteousness. I pray this in your name. Amen.